Thank you everyone for joining us for another Learning Lunch hosted by FormatApproved.com. My name is Wendy Whitmore. I'm the CIO of Format Approved and I'll be sitting in for Brian Johnson, our regular moderator today. Today's Learning Lunch is entitled The Forecast for HIPAA and Hosting, Cloudy with a Chance of Compliance. We're joined today by Tim Perry, Chief Information Officer of Healthcare2, which provides HIPAA and medical grade cloud services for covered entities and business associates. Tim has over 25 years of experience in developing and managing shared services around the world. You can read more about Tim's credentials on your screen while I take care of some quick webinar notes. Remember that you can ask questions of our presenter at any time during today's session by entering them into our chat area. In the second half of our session, we will address as many questions as time allows. If we do run out of time, answers to all submitted questions will be posted to our website and sent via email link later in the week. Also, please note that all registered attendees of today's session will receive an email with links to both the slides and the recorded versions of the event. So, Tim, tell us, um, who has to comply with HIPAA? This is not just MDs, DOs, you know, the collections of MDs and DOs and hospitals and so on. This applies to any healthcare provider who makes a HIPAA covered transaction electronically. Uh, dietitians, uh, funeral directors, pharmacists, acupuncturists, you know, anyone who deals with protected health information uh, and, and provides health services. So it's really important to, to understand that the scope is much, much larger. Uh, there are several hundred uh, NPI codes if you look at the taxonomy for healthcare providers. So all of those folks probably use uh, business associates to help them with their, uh, with their office work, to help with billing and so on. Um, and any time that there is an exchange or transmission or maintenance of protected health information from a covered entity to another organization that's not a covered entity, uh, a business associate relationship exists. And uh, that's something that is an omnibus now going to be direct liability for business associates. Uh, in the past, they've never been directly covered under HIPAA. And I know that um, from our experience that that new um, that new focus or that new requirement on those business associates means that um, not only are they required to comply with HIPAA, but they are also um, uh, responsible if that breach happens in connection with anyone that they're providing those services to or through or for, um, correct? And, and, in, and in such cases, they really need to have um, essentially a business associate agreement in place with those medical environments and those transaction organizations because, um, you know, in that way they're able to uh, communicate the relationship around that, that HIPAA responsibility. Absolutely. The, uh, the chain of trust now in, in the omnibus was explicitly made to include subcontractors. So the covered entity may provide to the business associate some PHI. If the business associate then needs to engage a subcontractor and exchange that uh, information, that subcontractor is now a business associate and must also have a business associate agreement that is uh, at least as restrictive as the originating business associate agreement with that covered entity. Uh, so for example, uh, if, if, a, if a physician or an acupuncturist or massage therapist or someone were using services uh, with our organization and we uh, in turn have an off-site uh, backup with, uh, with another organization, so I have to have a business associate arrangement with that off-site backup organization uh, because they are a subcontractor to me carrying PHI from that covered entity. So, you know, again, very important to note for practices and consultants that, you know, identifying really anyone within the organization who is inclined to have access to or um, or connection to any of that um, electronic uh, health information 
is required to uh, or is is required to comply with HIPAA or is required to have some sort of um, associate agreement in place. Uh, and I guess with the omnibus change, a lot of folks were unclear on that fact. So I think it's very important to to reiterate that. Yeah, you know, it's a, you know there's that, and additionally, they are very clear now that the, the federal common law of agency applies, such that if a violation happens downstream, if there is agency, and that's a you have to ask an attorney for more clarification on that, uh, it can actually go all the way upstream to the other business associate, all the way to the covered entity. Absolutely, absolutely. And one of the things that you mentioned in that prior question was around um, transactions relating to um, the protected health information. A lot of people don't realize that there are protections outlined uh, and, it's, and it's relevant to the kind of PCI DSS um, regulations uh, relevant to payment collection. So if you're collecting payment for treatment and that information is transacted and also translated through um, you know, payment channels with that health information connected, uh, that also is covered under the HIPAA requirements. Yes, there are, there are um, you know, billing collections and uh, you know, benefits management, and even someone coming in to do a, uh, a quality assessment on the doctor's office or you know, whatever covered entity it might be, if they have access to the PHI, indeed, they are, they're going to be a business associate. Absolutely. So um, why don't you tell us what PHI encompasses? What, what exactly are folks um, talking about when they talk about the electronic protected health information? Right, and, and, and this, is, I, I have this, this is one of my more interesting conversations I have with folks uh, where they, oftentimes they believe that uh, protected health information is uh, the person's name and some diagnosis, uh, but it's far, far, far more than that. So in HIPAA there are 18 identifiers uh, name obviously is in there, but geographic subdivisions smaller than a state, um, you know, dates, um, phone numbers, fax numbers, IP addresses are all considered uh, individually identifiable and one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is it has to be something health, some kind of health information. So, you know, basically if it's, if it's something that they get from the uh, uh, related to a condition, provision, of health care or payment, uh, those two together make for protected health information. So my fax number and uh, the fact that I have an upcoming appointment would be PHI together. Uh, so it's not, it's not as easy as you know, a person's name and a condition. It's actually much larger than that. And as a real, if you want to de-identify the protected health information, there's a very laborious effort that you need to be very sure that you deleted everything. So, you know, PHI um, has a lot of different delivery methods. Everybody kind of thinks about it as part of the electronic health record or part of the, you know, um, uh, part of the communication from doctor to doctor in a referral situation. But there are a lot of different ways that that PHI can be um, uh, transmuted from one group to another or from one person to another and it's really really critical for the provider and for um, the health plan and the folks that are involved in, in transferring that information to understand that really anything that connects a patient with information about their um, health conditions is considered PHI. Exactly. And and that's usually when, when eyes start to light up and you know, they begin to understand it's more than just someone's name and a, and a condition. It's a really anything that has to do with the provision of healthcare services. Absolutely. Since we are here talking about the various, in, various ways in which um, the protected health information is stored and uh, delivered and transferred and we're talking rather specifically about uh, cloud uh, communication. Why don't you give us some idea about the IT resourcing models for holding and storing and maintaining that protected health information? Sure, and, and this is kind of where we see people who, once they even understand what PHI is and that they are a covered entity or a business associate, uh, the questions begin to go off. 
you know, well, what can I do with that PHI? How, you know, what, what things are available to me? And so there are two basic resourcing models available. One is you do it yourself. Uh, you know, and this is something that many people have been doing for years where it's on someone's laptop, it's on a uh, server that someone has under, you know, the, admin, the, uh, you know, the receptionist desks, uh, or it's actually it's usually back in the building department. Uh, I mean, I've, I've been in offices where it really was two antiquated servers plugged into a common power strip into one outlet in the wall with <laughs> um, a coffee maker right next door to it, I mean, right, yeah. right above it. So, uh, and backup tapes stacked right next to that. So, right. <laughs> I've seen that, that too. <laughs> that, that, that is not uncommon. And again, you know, these, these are healthcare professionals, not IT professionals, and, you know, it, it's it's just understandable that that's not where their focus is. Uh, so many of them have done it themselves. I, I, everything from the simple laptop to sometimes actually fairly nice uh, data center closets uh, that they've installed in their offices. Uh, we've even had conversations with folks who want to get rid of those closets and turn them into uh, supply closets or maybe even an exam room. So that's then the other model is where it's hosted. Uh, you're using somebody else's resources. You know, so there's some level of either assumed risk or trust that the, the person is, is uh, you know, going to do what they need to do with that protected health information. Uh, and there, the basic this brass tax models in hosting are shared, and that's the you know, 395 for unlimited bandwidth, unlimited storage, unlimited you know, everything. Uh, and you know, there's a reason it's uh, shared and, and inexpensive. Uh, dedicated where you basically have a server somewhere in, uh, that, they, that someone else owns, but you're using it, but it's your server. Uh, a variety of uh, forms of cloud, and just my definition of cloud, because I'm usually asked what I mean by cloud, it's the illusion of infinite resources. You know, the idea is that you can get what you want whenever you need it. Uh, and it's, it's based on, on, a mo on a capacity planning model. And then finally, co-location, where you, you hire a, your own cage or rack in a data center, and uh, you share a number of things with folks, like access to the building and power and connectivity. But you know, what happens inside that cage uh, for your storage and your processing are, are usually uh, yours to manage. And, uh, you know, Tim, the, the interesting thing about those hosting, using, and others uh, resources category is that it is incumbent upon the, um, the provider or the practice who is choosing to host elsewhere uh, to identify and, and um, uh, execute um, a business associate agreement with each one of those folks. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. And... Again, a, another point of surprise for many people uh, that they don't, they don't know sometimes that they need to have that business associate agreement in place. And many in the hosting industry want nothing to do with signing a business associate agreement. That's, it's not what they do for a living. Right, and, and that's, that's been one of the most interesting um, revelations for us is when people reach out to us uh, at Format and, and talk to us about what, the, what their needs are around um, HIPAA services and, and products and things. One of the first things that we identify pretty commonly among smaller practices in particular is that they don't realize um, how many business associate agreements uh, would be related to some of the conversations that they're having around their data, where they want to keep it, where they're hosting it currently. Um, you know, often they will think that just because the data is housed inside their electronic health record that they're covered. Um, and they don't realize that often with that EHR, um, the data itself, the patient records themselves, are hosted, you know, in a separate location from the application. Oh, and that's probably what, I mean, if it were just EHR space, it would probably be far less breaches, but people will pull a spreadsheet from an EHR in order to do reports, know, work, reports, and so on, and, and then that, that spreadsheet is on a laptop, on a, on a USB drive, is, you know, on a, on a CD, and it goes missing. 
Right, and that's that's what has been happening more recently. Uh, you and I were just talking about that um, the dermatology practice um, that that um, lost or misplaced a, a flash drive, correct? Correct, and then that resulted in a hundred fifty thousand dollar fine for what is really just a mundane incident. Uh, it's not some you know large international cabal of you know hackers who went after this. Uh, this practice. <clears throat> it, it was simply that someone was doing their job, uh, you know, and, and, and lost a USB drive. It's, it's not uncommon at all. Right. So, you know, again, um, when you're talking about resourcing models for storing protected health information, obviously there, you know, that was um, not uncommon what you mentioned in the beginning, which is that you've got, you know, folks um, hosting all of their uh, patient records internal to the practice where they're, you know, it's either all loaded up on one workstation or they've got a small server and they've got it hosted on a, a, a local small server, etc. Um, in all of those cases, you want to make sure that there is some uh, method uh, by which your practice is protecting that information. So if it's on your work, singular workstation, then there's a high hope in my mind that you're going to have um, some kind of backup <laughs> for that uh, <laughs> protected health information. And if you do, do you know if the backup service that you're using has um, a business associate agreement in place and a HIPAA compliance um, policy? Uh, those are important things to, to be aware of. And then certainly if you're hosting outside of your primary environment and you're in a shared environment or you're in a cloud environment, um, et cetera, that all of those things are still applicable, you know, all the way through um, the maintenance and accessibility of that protected health information. Right, and then that's why the, the distinctions between those different levels of or different types of uh, hosted services is very, is very critical because some of those business models simply do not allow for the level of attention that you would need for HIPAA and PHI. Absolutely. Very important thing to pay attention to. Um, so, Tim, how can the listeners on this particular webinar know which IT resource model is better for their specific situation or their clients? I know often we have both um, medical community members and consultants that work with those members on these on these webinars. Um, can you just talk about what those recommendations would be? How do you figure out which thing is best for you? Yeah, it's uh, I, I I've been in IT for a very long time, working you know in shared services around the world, and usually the wrong way to start the conversation is to talk about it's a you know this technology will do X, Y, and Z. Uh, that's usually the wrong way to look at it. Uh, I would. I always recommend to folks that what is it that you want to accomplish? And in, in, this, in this specific example, uh, this is really just a risk management question. Uh, you know, it's perfectly fine for someone to want to run their own server in their practice if they have that capability and if they're willing to assume those risks. Uh, so in risk management, there are really four ways to address risk. Uh, one is uh, you can assume the risks. So you know, what risks are you willing to assume? And important here to understand is if you choose not to do something to a risk, where I define risk as a combination of a threat and a vulnerability, if you choose not to do something, you've just assumed that, that risk. Uh, sometimes people will want to control or mitigate the risk themselves. They have the competency, they have the resources, uh, and, and you know they want to address it themselves. They will write their own policies and procedures, uh, or they will uh, run their own IT services and so on. Uh, sometimes people want to transfer a risk. Uh, they acknowledge that it's a uh, something that is really not inside their wheelhouse, so they will ask for uh, insurance coverage in case an event happens, or they will go to a, a hosting provider who specializes in. PHI in this case, uh, you know, or you know, some other, some other service, uh, and then sometimes it, people will just avoid the risk. Uh, this is one of the uh, common occurrences, especially in, in the early days of EHR uh, with meaningful use, where uh, some practices, smaller practices with um, you know o older physicians, 
would say, you know, I'm just going to close my practice. I'm going to avoid this whole thing, <laughs> and I'm just going to close my practice and go fishing. And that's a legitimate risk management uh, <laughs> option. It's, uh, and, you know, if, if I were in a position where I could close my practice and go fishing, maybe I would look at it, too. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all would, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so really what you want to do in the way of um, hosting with someone who's focused on this uh, or doing it yourself <clears throat> is a calculus of what, what risks am I willing to assume or transfer you know, what, and, and then what capabilities do I have as an organization? Right. And, again, I think that um, that uh, that is probably, you know, as you mentioned, probably one of the best first questions to ask yourself is, you know, what, what level of risk are you willing to assume internally and what would you prefer um, was managed by, for instance, you know, a professional hosting organization or somebody along those lines. So, Tim, you have an example here with an analogy about levels of risk. So on the y-axis, you'll see choice or control. And it's basically what you're able to do that in, in, the, in that environment, where you have sole control over something. Um, and then on the x-axis are the different types of um, hosting models, from shared all the way to co-location. And then along, uh, along each of those, I, I gave an analogy where Think of it as the shared model as the dorm room. You know, you're sharing, uh, you know, the room. You're sharing the bedroom. You're sharing the television. You're sharing probably just about everything except your toothbrush, and sometimes you're not even sure about that. Uh, dedicated is more. It's it's your apartment. Um, you you have your your own defined space. Uh, you know, you share. You know, my ceiling is your floor, so you know you have some of that. But it's hard to expand. So you may have a dedicated server someplace, but when you run out of disk space, there's usually a, a real challenge to, uh, to, to give you more disk space, you know, what in cloud we call elasticity. Uh, and then if you think about cloud, it's really ownership in a, in a, time, in a series of timeshares around the world where the resources you need, where you need them, you, you, you get them uh, you know, by subscribing to them. So, I need a um, one unit in uh, Milan for a week. I need two units in uh, New York City for uh, you know a family gathering. I need uh, a unit in Orlando for another week. So, depending on what you need, and you know the technical corollary to that would be, you know, I need two gigs of RAM uh, today, but during my busy season, you know, flu epidemic or whatever, I may need to increase it to four megs of RAM and. 20 gigs of storage and so on, you know, three cores instead of two cores. So you can go up and down based on the needs. And then, you know, the co-location is kind of a homeowner's association. You, you own the house. There's no doubt about it. And whatever you do inside the house is pretty well your, your decision. You may share common entrance and, you know, the homeowner's association collects dues and maybe they decorate it at Christmas. But there are certain rules. You know, you can't park, you know, your four-wheel drive up on cinder blocks in the middle of the, dry, uh, the middle of the yard and paint your house pink. You know, there are certain, certain controls that they put in place. Right. So, I, yeah, I like that analogy. That's, that's helpful to kind of understand what, you know, from a, uh, from a uh, choice perspective, again, as you were mentioning, kind of what level of risk you're willing to, to hold on to um, in, your, right. in your primary practice. Um, Likelihood and impact. Why don't you uh, comment on that from a from a, uh, a high level perspective? Sure. And, and again, this is just the, the, the risk management you know choices uh, where likelihood is on the y axis, impact is on the uh, x axis. And really, this helps people determine where it is that they know if it's if it if it's not very likely to happen, and if it's a very low impact, I'll probably just assume the risk and you know let you know let it be. Uh, if it's really high impact and if it's really likely to happen, I'm probably just going to avoid it entirely. You know, <laughs> close that practice, close that product line, whatever it might be. Uh, it, and in the middle is based on where I, how much capability I have, how much control I want to uh, have have over it, versus how much I want to transfer it. And that comes down to a lot of organizational capabilities and 
where I want to put my resources. I don't want to buy tens of thousands of dollars of uh, high-end hardware with, re with redundancy. So I may go hire that from the cloud. Right. And and interestingly, in your bottom left-hand corner, um, I, <laughs> I think that a lot of uh, medical communities, particularly smaller practices, have been um, making the assumption that the, their, their uh, exposure to risk um, around, you know, breaches and or audits is so low that they are, you know, largely um, deciding to do very little. Uh, and, and subsequently, I think, unfortunately, what that means is they are exposing themselves to more risk than they might have, you know, several years ago when there wasn't the same, um, um, what, spyglass on top of everything that's going on around protected health information. There is definitely um, a much closer attention paid nowadays to that electronic health information, not only from the governmental agencies, but from the patients themselves, I think, because of, of a lot of talk uh, around those patient uh, records and those patient uh, uh, health information uh, being exposed. That, that's a great point, especially about the, how the patients are now more involved. Uh, re remember that many, you know, I would say the bulk of what uh, the Office for Civil Rights, uh, which is charged with enforcing HIPAA, they get in the neighborhood of 10,000 complaints through their website and then other means from patients. Uh, so it, it's very important to understand that patients are taking far more uh, responsibility for their own health care and their information. Uh, there was, you know, this idea that do-it-yourself health care. People are becoming very active in, in, in making decisions, and they want that information. They want to know that it's, it's being safeguarded. So uh, the, I think the patients are, are a new force that really wasn't on the horizon just a few years ago. Right, exactly, and I I think that is something to be to be mindful of. If you're if you're choosing to do nothing or very little as it relates to taking responsibility for these requirements, um, there's a chance that um, the audit and breach um, uh, notification won't come from the government. It might just come from from your patients who are concerned about yeah. their about their their own information. Um, so. On the hosting side, I know a lot of, we get a lot of questions here about what the hosting options are and, you know, because the EHR companies in particular, for instance, will tell you that they have a couple of options for delivering your, um, your EHR services. Uh, you can host it in-house on a server internally. You can host it with a hosting service company. You can uh, subscribe to it via their SaaS or their cloud-based services. Um, so when you are making those decisions, do these HIPAA requirements apply to those various hosting levels? Yeah, there, there are many, many things in HIPAA that are vague, unclear, uh, you know, subject to interpretation. Uh, this is not one of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they actually bothered to put in the preamble of the omnibus uh, the paragraph you see on the screen. And they, they used as an example a data storage company, uh, whether digital or hard copy, uh, is a business associate even if they don't view the information or do so on, only on occasion. So if your information, your PHI, is sitting with someone for backup, for hosting, uh, and it doesn't, and again, it's not just the EHR. If someone is hosting your billing records or someone is doing billing on your behalf and is holding those billing records for you, those are all BAA uh, requirements. So for example, a, a practice that uses a billing company and the billing company is hosting uh, its software, there needs to be a business associate agreement from the practice to the billing company because they have access and they're using uh, the information. And then the billing company needs to have a business associate agreement with that hosting provider to make sure that everything is being you know, held appropriately. I mean, it's very clear. If you, if you are storing it, even if you're not viewing it, you need to have that relationship. Absolutely. Um, and I think people don't realize that when they engage outside service companies um, to 
you know, back up or store or, or host, I think, I think they're not, you know, 100% mindful of the fact that there are nuances to different parts of their data that might be hosted in those areas. So uh, I'm sure we'll get to some questions around that, but um, yeah, I think it's I think it's important to note that uh, anytime you're hosting uh, and you have any of the patient information in that hosting environment, um, HIPAA is is relevant. Yeah, absolutely, and that and, and it's clearly identified in the omnibus. So if, there, if there's any doubt, yeah, that people are free to use that slide to help, help understand. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, as we just have been mentioning, things are happening um, at, a, at a somewhat rapid pace uh, since the omnibus rule. Um, and from your perspective, why do you think that this uh, breach risk and, and the risk of, of um, of running up against these HIPAA requirements is increasing? Well, if, if we go back to, if you think a, a moment for the risk management model that we just discussed, where there's an, a likelihood and, a, and an impact, th those are coming together. So there's increasing likelihood of a number of a risk, uh, risk events, and there's increasing impact of those risk events. So five years ago, health information technology was not, was not that rampant. Now, through meaningful use and and patient expectations, more people are using that, you know, and, and collecting apps on their through their iPhone and sharing that PHI with their, with their physicians and a number of other things. Uh, fines are no longer a nuisance. Uh, you know, instead of the twenty-five thousand dollar fine, now it's a potentially a, a million five uh, per violation per calendar year for for HIPAA, and you know that, and there could be other fines involved. Uh, there is a legal mandate where uh, there must be audits this year, and they will include business associates. Uh, business associates are now directly liable. It's funny, if you look at the regulations for the omnibus, it will say uh, in the security rule, you know, you know, covered entities. Now, there's specifically covered entities and business associates. They bothered to insert that to make sure that everyone understood that business associates were included. And the fact that you do not have a business associate agreement does not mean you are not a business associate. It's based on the activity. Uh, and OCR, the Office for Civil Rights, can now use these fines that they're collecting to further their own, uh, their, their, their own operations as well as make restitution. Uh, your Director Rodriguez is a seasoned prosecutor and healthcare attorney, so this, uh, things have really picked up under him. Uh, there was a great, uh, when he first took office, there was a really good, uh, well, good in, in the way that it was informative, not good that, because I'm sure he didn't enjoy it, but um, Senator Al Franken uh, really gave him a grilling about, you know, why isn't HIPAA getting implemented? And, and he said, you know, that he would make, make this happen, and I believe that he's really going all out to do that. Um, and then and the last thing on the slide that is really fascinating, there's a uh, study by the World Privacy Forum. Basically, on the black market, your social security number is worth, say, a dollar. Your medical identification information is worth about $50. So there's wow. an incentive for people to go out and find medical information uh, so that they can do uh, additional billing for a procedure. Uh, they, can, they can simply, you know, make believe that they are you and get services. So there are a number of black market activities associated with uh, getting PHI, and the more lucrative it is, the more people are going to go looking for it. Well, that's that's an interesting point. I hadn't thought of that, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously there are a number of uh, different ways in which hackers and and uh, people who are are wanting to take advantage of um, you know others. Uh, financial and security information are leveraging that, you know, the target breach, obviously, and, and things, you know, credit card information, et cetera. Um, and, I, you know, very interesting to note that if they get a hold of your health information, uh, certainly your insurance information, et cetera, uh, they could potentially leverage that for, for additional, you know, support internally. That's uh, it's a little frightening, but it does, you know, explain why we're seeing a lot more reporting of, of um, breaches and, and various risks. Um, on the um, 
the HIPAA services. What can can you give us some examples? Um, some HIPAA capable service uh, examples. Sure, and sometimes people will will ask you if it's you know, if it's technology, it's really you know what you're using in this place and that place can be the same. You know the same hardware manufacturers, the same you know virtualization software, the same operating systems. So where where is some where are some of the differences? What's the benefit of using someone who's focused on risk management, HIPAA compliance, and so on? And so an example that we, that we use sometimes we pulled from the regulations and the three regulations are quoted there. One basically talks about the, you know, the, the system activity reviews that you need to be doing. Uh, and, and really anyone, whether you're doing it yourself or whether you're using a hosting service, really should be doing things like checking the audit logs, you know, you know, developing access reports, uh, you know, security incident tracking. So you're, you should be doing these things by regulation. And then there should be some record of what you're doing. Uh, you know, that, you know, otherwise, either you know that you're doing it. You know, that's, that's one of the steps in, in good quality management is, is measuring and continuing to improve, but it's also required as, by that regulation. And then the third one is there's a time limit. So all the data, you know, all these records and everything that you're collecting, well, they have to be stored for six years. And understand that given what PHI is, it's one of those 18 identifiers and health information, there, that, that information itself may be PHI. It may be someone's IP address and you know, the fact that they logged in to look at a uh, patient portal. So that is now potentially PHI. So even protecting that and storing it for six years. So those are things that, that it's not just a matter of fill up some hard drives and you know, a couple of VMware machines. There are policies, procedures, and understanding of compliance and risk management that need to be uh, available. And so when you're talking about a HIPAA-capable HIPAA service, you're talking about a hosting service or a backup service or a storage service that has uh, HIPAA policies in place and an understanding of a protection of that documentation. That, that's, that's absolutely correct for, uh, for, for hosting, which is one, one, one of my, my favorite topics, but it also applies to anyone who's trying to be HIPAA capable. So if you're a billing provider, are you capturing all this information and are you storing it for six years either internally or with a provider? Or a hosting well, provider, sorry. Provider also means physician. Right, right, and it, you know it is it is interesting that um, uh, that just because someone says that or or some organization or product provider or service provider online in particular says that they you know are secure, and I put that in air quotes even though you can't see me, um, that does not necessarily mean that they that they um, are referencing secure at the level of HIPAA protection, and those are the questions that you need to ask. Exactly. I mean, you know, PCI has a, 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 some really good things in it, and, uh, and it, in some cases it's far more, it is actually way more prescriptive than HIPAA is, but there are some differences that aren't addressed in PCI, for example. Right, but it is important to know both. I mean, I think, you know, uh, when people think about HIPAA, they're not always thinking about those payment card protections. Um, and and those are important as well. And I think that often that you're right where PCI does not always have, you know, the detail of HIPAA as it relates to the patient health information. Um, it does, they, they do um, connect. There is, a, there, are, there is a point where they connect. They absolutely have overlap, and they complement each other fairly well, but they are different, so one does not replace the other. That's correct. Um, and so what do the providers and the business associates, uh, the consultants that are working with the providers, um, need to be aware of and, and put into their, um, their checklist? The, the, the first and foremost is HIPAA does not equal EHR. HIPAA <laughs> is about protected health information. And you have protected health information in a number of different places, not just in an EHR. EHR is is the you know the Fort Knox. You know it's you know, it's obviously where a lot of the wealth is as far as PHI goes, but it's not the only place. So folks really need to need to understand that 
every every instance of PHI is subject to HIPAA, whether it's on a thumb drive, whether it's with a billing service, a collection service, a practice management service, you know, a hosting provider, uh, wherever it is, it's subject to PHI. It doesn't have to be in the EHR. Um, and again, those anyone who is hosting your your IT infrastructure, uh, if they're storing PHI, they are a business associate, uh, whether they view it or not. It, you know, because I, I I I see the you know the debates on on the different forums and it's you know but I never look at it like you know that's nice and I'm sure you don't but it doesn't matter it says in the omnibus you are a VA even if you don't look at it uh, there is growing enforcement of HIPAA uh, there are going to be audits this year uh, the the fines uh, have have been far far more than people would have ever expected say five years ago. Uh, and there, there's more reason to, uh, and, and patients are more involved in enforcement. They are filing complaints when they are not getting access to their protected health information, that they, they can't get the disclosures, if they, if they don't know what they want to know about who's been looking, they, they can file complaints. And um, that's important because if you're a business associate, you are now directly liable. Whether you've signed a business associate agreement or not, you know, if you are acting like a business associate, you are a business associate. You just now have a violation as well. Right. And, <laughs> and you are directly liable under HIPAA. You know, you, business associates are now specifically included in the security rule. Privacy rules are much, vague, much more vague now, but the security rule they inserted business associate, you know, and business associate. Uh, and so if you're storing PHI, you are indeed a business associate. Right. And I, and I think another thing that you mentioned earlier that is important to keep on your, on your uh, high level of awareness is that people often, even when, even when they think or, or they feel confident that their EHR is, is you know, protecting them uh, and protecting that information with various password protocols and, and uh, you know, and their own sort of internal protections around that patient health information, uh, there are many, many situations where uh, you're working with that EHR and you've decided to uh, run a report, uh, for instance, on, you know, patients in different scenarios for your own review purposes. If that report is printed out or sitting on your screen or has moved into your hard drive, that report holds information about those patients, potentially their name, possibly their, their ID, um, and information about their various health conditions, that is a potential breach right there. Even if it's coming from your EHR, if that got printed out or if that's up on your screen in Excel or in some other format and you're leaving it sitting there outside of that EHR environment, that um, creates the potential for breach. Yeah, I mean, it's not uncommon for someone to you know, create one of those reports, hand it off for a patient safety activity. You know, many people are going through uh, patient-centered medical home uh, surveys right now, and you know, they need to understand that when they're engaging with someone to help them with that PCMH certification, and they're giving them patient data, they're giving them uh, you know protected health information. There is a BAA that needs to be in place because they are now acting as a business associate to help get the practice certified for PCMH. If they're doing repricing, or if they're doing you know, much of the work that's going on for ICD-9 to ICD-10, you know, if you're going in and looking at you know, patient uh, you know, you know, ICD-9 codes and trying to figure out which ones are going to translate for that practice and how to set up systems to make that happen, that engagement is accessing PHI. If someone decides to take a copy of those reports, put them on a floppy or a floppy, listen to me, a CD <laughs> or a USB drive and, uh, and take them back to their office to do the analysis, that is PHI and now if, it's, if, if they lose that USB drive, there's a problem. Absolutely. Well, we have, um, Tim, thank you very much for all of that. Um, I, I, you know, obviously we cover a lot in, um, in our learning lunch sessions on the topic of HIPAA with various spins and angles, and we've discussed a lot of, uh, of different um, uh, 
topics around HIPAA, but this obviously today our intent was to focus more specifically on the hosting environments and the cloud uh, relationship to protected health information. And um, generally at this point in the session what we do is we open up for folks to submit questions to our presenter. Uh, we have a couple up here already, so if you have questions about this presentation or from this presenter relating to um, cloud services in HIPAA, any kind of hosting, uh, any business associate relationships that you might have around those types of things, uh, please let us know. And in the meantime, I'm just going to um, toss a couple of questions at you, Tim, and, and let's, um, let's see if we can get some of these uh, participants some answers. Um, one person is asking, uh, does this apply to um, cloud services companies such as Salesforce. Are you familiar with Salesforce, Tim? I am familiar with Salesforce. Uh, actually, I just answered this question for, for a company. Uh, if you're storing patient data with Salesforce, uh, then there is a business associate relationship. And, and to their credit, Salesforce actually recognizes that they have a specialized health service and uh, you know, they, they can address so, you know, kudos to Salesforce for being on top of this. Yeah, and, and not all companies are. So, yes, I, I think that's, that's a good and important thing to note. Um, practices, particularly larger practices, often use Salesforce as a way to outreach to potential new patients um, and also to do some additional marketing or outreach to existing patients. And in those cases, if there are any, you know, uh, components in that, um, in that application that have that information around uh, the patients in some kind of categorization, something very simple around, you know, what type of patient this is, then um, important to note that Salesforce does um, have that, that, you know, familiarity and has that business associate agreement option in yeah. place. And just make sure that you actually go ask them for it and that right. you sign up correctly and that you get everything, uh, because you should not just assume because it would be a violation if you don't have the BAA in place. Right, so just knowing that they do have that capability is not enough. You have to go that extra step and inquire and get the correct paperwork and the correct sign-offs. Is that right? Absolutely, that is yeah. correct. You, 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 I mean, you really, if you're going to, before you send PHI anywhere, there needs to be a BAA in place. Unless it's a covered entity for uh, use of uh, treatment, billing, or business operations. So if it's covered entity to covered entity, there are other protocols involved. Well, that's that's a good thing to know as well. Um, I'm sure we'll have some questions about that detail after the fact. <laughs> um, and another question: um, If there's a company that that won't sign a BAA, um, but you have a contract with them, does that uh, justify potentially? being able to break that contract. So actually we had this come through um, one of our uh, partner relationships here at Format where somebody asked us, hey, you know, we have a, a three-year contract with this hosting company um, for our backup, but they've told us they won't sign a business associate agreement. Would you, I mean, obviously they should talk to their attorney, which is what we recommended, but um, wh what are your thoughts around whether or not, you know, that's, that's justification to, to finalize that contract? Uh, I will preface it with I'm not an attorney. Uh, <laughs> several of my partners are attorneys and we've actually had this very conversation and from what I've gleaned from them, uh, if, if the contracted service is not provided or if, there, if, the, you know, if the backup uh, company cannot provide the contracted service, then where 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 is you know the default would actually be on them, so right? If for so for if example, I if if I as, as a company that uh, we have protected health information through BAAs with our customers, if I needed to back that up off site and, and we do and we have appropriate contracts, but if we, uh, let's say the my my vendors all of a sudden said no, uh, I'm no I, I'm no longer going to be able to do this for you. Uh, then they are defaulting on the contract. You know, it's your, you know, I, I, if, now if the contract just doesn't, doesn't address the nature of the, of the backup PHI, then there may not be a default, but there may be no longer the ability to 
uh, meet the obligation, and then it would, I guess it would just be dissolved. Again, that, that's a great attorney question, and if I had right. my partners with me, you'd get a better answer, but from, from what I can mimic of them, uh, no, there, you, know, you have to be able to perform the service for them. Well, it's interesting. We have a, an immediate follow-up legal question. So I think what, and, and, and I will pose it to you, and perhaps what we'll do, um, as we often do with questions um, after our sessions, is if we do not have a definitive answer, uh, we certainly can toss out our thoughts. But if we don't have a definitive answer, particularly with a, a, a question that is um, uh, based in a, in a legal argument, uh, we can take that out and um, possibly Tim could take that to his attorney partners and get a, a more clear answer for you that can be sent to you after the session. Um, or uh, another thing I'm thinking about as we're talking about this, Tim, is that what we might want to do is bring some of your partners back on and do a legal discussion because I think um, people do have a lot of questions from a legal standpoint, particularly in this business associate uh, universe about what they are liable for and what they're not. Oh, great idea. I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to bring that back to them. Um, and so the, one of those questions here is um, that somebody had a contract that stated that, um, uh, that had a clause in the, in the agreement that, that states that, the covered, that if they're a covered entity, um, then there's no need for a BA agreement between two covered entities. Is it, have you guys had that discussion? Um, I think that kind of goes what I just said earlier. Uh, if covered entity to covered entity uh, for treatment, for billing, for uh, business operations, uh, do not require a BAA. Now, again, I'm not an attorney, but uh, if someone did a quick search through the, uh, the omnibus, you, you would find that, that, that regulation in there. I don't have it in front of me, though. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that uh, to be 100% clear, uh, you know, we are not on the line with, with attorneys, but we are talking about various clauses in business associate agreements, but covered entity to covered entity, um, it, it sounds like um, you are protected in that scenario. But again, I think we will address that um, more specifically and make sure that we've got that in our list of, of answers back to the inquirers. Um, one additional question. if there is a support company for the electronic health record, and I, they're not saying the specific type of support company, but let's say um, an IT support company uh, for the EHR or um, that supports the EHR, you know, to do updates and, and things along those lines. Are they um, in, uh, required to sign a, a business associate agreement? Uh, my gut tells me yes, because yeah. they are probably going to have access I mean, if, if they can do support without having any access, whether they view it or not, to the uh, protected health information, um, then I would say that they wouldn't. But most, most support efforts that I know, uh, whether they're, you know, going in and doing a, um, it, listen, from a systems administration perspective, if they're just going in and looking at, you know, performance tuning and, you know, I.O. usage and so on, they still actually have access to that protected health information. They may not care that it's there. They may be more worried about uh, CPU performance and, you know, you have the right number of cores or something that they're trying to optimize your system. Uh, but yes, they have access. Right. Um, one funny question. Um, this is <laughs> um, if if you happen to know, and and if we don't, if if you don't have an answer to this, I'm pretty sure I can find an answer to this. Um, is it known if OCR has investigated any breaches and not imposed a fine to date? It's it's funny. Um, I, I this may be dated information. We wrote a white paper uh, during the summer, and we actually looked at some some of the. Uh, OCR investigations, and to my, it, what we found when we wrote the white paper was that there was only one fine ever levied, and it was because the, the, the um, covered entity was quite belligerent uh, in, in, with OCR. Everything else is a civil monetary penalty, uh, and so it's it's a, an agreement that okay, th you know, there was a breach or a violation, and we're going to work with OCR to fix it, and. You know, Director Rodriguez has been very clear. He wants to work with the healthcare industry and business associates, and he wants his staff to work with them. You know, they will enforce compliance, but they want, you know, the, they they want people to 
to work with them and not, not out of fear so much. So there's one fine to my knowledge, and there, there may be more since then, uh, but the others are civil monetary penalties, and, and, and it's an agreement that they reach. Got it. Um, two more questions before we wind up, because we are running to the end of our time here and our hour. Um, one quick question is, if um, you have a CPA or bookkeeper for the practice, do they need a BA? Uh, if they see any of the PHI, yes. So if all you're giving them are, you know, we took in, you know, $30,000 and we spent $27,000, no, there's not much to see. But if you're, if you're showing them that, you know, we collected, you know, $75 from Mrs. Smith, well, now that's PHI. Right, and the question too, and around that, I know um, often our question is, you know, my my question back to the inquirer is, um, is that CPA or bookkeeper um, accessing your practice management software or your billing software um, connected to your electronic health record in order to do their work? If they are, then yes, I would absolutely have a VA in place for them. Would you agree? Uh, I mean, if they if they have if they have a direct connection, that's access. That's obvious. Yeah. But if they, um, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. But even if you make a spreadsheet from from whatever source, it doesn't even have to be from directly from the EHR, and you give them, you know, here here are our billing records. You know, Mrs. Smith was seventy five dollars, Mr. Jones was, you know, seventy three dollars. That is PHI. And even if you don't have direct connections uh, to the EHR, you have no direct connections to the office, you have a thumb drive with that information. Congratulations, you're now a business associate. Right, <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you, Tim. Um, basically, uh, at this point, we do have a handful of additional questions uh, here in our question box. So I just want to let everybody know on the line who has submitted a question. Um, we will summarize these questions. Our presenter will answer any outstanding questions um, so that we can post them to the end of this session on our recorded version and in our, um, our deck documentation that you will uh, receive links to via email following the session. So thank you very much for uh, submitting all of your questions. Um, so that you know, um, you know, we we run these learning lunch sessions uh, a couple of times a week every week. If you've not yet registered for our learning lunch announcements, please do so on our homepage at formatapproved.com. Uh, thank you, Tim, for joining us for today's learning lunch. Uh, to learn more about industry expert Tim Perry and the Healthcare 2 services, please visit Healthcare 2, and that is T-O-O, healthcaretoo.com. Thanks, Tim. We hope to have you back again, and maybe next time we'll have you bring on some of your legal partners, and we'll get some additional questions answered next time around. My pleasure. Thank you.